they have uh, a worship area like it's it's a sweet green room it's like it's like something the beatles or the stones would Mm -hmm. stay in at a concert right Mm -hmm. but they're just having normal conversation like where is this coming from (laughs) it's coming on this i went all around the church and finally i found it back there and i I couldn't believe it yeah just up and across i uh keep meaning we need to get some kind of those uh, acoustic sound panels yeah because it's still pretty cavernous in here to the kill echoey. some of the sound yeah a little echoey so mm-hmm. what would you do would you put it like on the door and the yeah you can the two uh, walls the walls yeah you can get them in either you know 24 by 24 squares you can get them in bigger things but yeah, something we, to just dampen the sound yeah i mean just even a few of them would work mm-hmm. if you put one there maybe one or two there and a couple there you'd be fine because this is I mean, it's, yeah, that'll do it's your background. Right. Does it make that big a difference when you have that? Stuff? It does. Oh, yeah. Does it? Yeah. Like if we just snapped our fingers right now and they were up, I would sound in your ears completely different than what mm-hmm. I do now. No you you yeah. hear the little bit of a ring and a little bit of a delay. Yeah. That's just because the sound is going everywhere. Mm-hmm. And once it hits that, it just dies and nice, yeah. soft. It absorbs right. the yeah. echo. Yeah. We're learning less. It's okay. Yeah, we are. Go start we're, somewhere. We're getting man. there. Yeah. Yeah. That's right. <laughs> Cool. No, this is great. Uh, yeah. All right, everybody. Hey, this is BK in DC with the ABC podcast, hanging out at the studio at Summit Lending. We've got our great friend, Mr. Les Norman, in the house. What's right up? on? Hi guys. Les. Good to be here. You're man. talking about great friend. I thought you were going to be talking about DC. So you know, <laughs> he's I'm, a good friend. I'm too. glad to be in there somewhere. Hey, man. We're super glad to have you. So yeah. quick, quick intro for Mr. Les Norman here. So Uh-oh. here, here we go. Let me know if I miss out. On anything, okay? You're good. So here we go, everyone. Former Kansas City Royal from 1995 to 96, host of the Killer Show, Breaking the Norm, radio show and podcast, keynote speaker, certified life coach, family, Kristen, your lovely wife, Mm -hmm. sons, Mark and Tate, and of course, most importantly, Past winner of Wheel of Fortune. Yes. Right? Bro. <laughs> yeah. I, would have led with, is, I would have led with that. That is a <laughs> resume, man. Well, because I, I, I speak a lot, people want your bio. And I'll put in the email, I put as many things as I can and say, don't use it all. Just pick out what you want. It's the first right. thing they always go to is like, I don't care about all other stuff. I just want to know about Wheel of Fortune. I, yeah, oh, it's so. huge. I was, in fact, I was telling my family this morning. So back in the day, you know, 80s, early 90s, my grandparents literally based their schedule around Will of Fortune. <laughs> this is no joke. It was like local news, and then it ran into yeah. Will of Fortune, and they would base dinner times and everything. Supper time. Supper, Supper not right. dinner. Supper so, time. And understand your generation you're talking about. Right? And yeah. they even had a framed picture. I forgot about this. They had a framed signed picture of Vanna White nice. on top of their TV. What? <laughs> no joke. No joke. Seriously? <laughs> That's, that's selling that's out thing, to the right. show, man. Right. Man, it is, you man. know, I would, I know Les kind of like, oh yeah, Wheel of Fortune, that's part of my thing. I, th- I saw you speak at the Chamber event mm-hmm. and you were like, somebody had that picture for your main picture yeah. to introduce you and you were like, oh man, I can't believe you used that picture of me. That's your main picture on your website. Yeah. <laughs> so well, I don't feel bad for you at all. That's, <laughs> yeah, my, my bride runs our website. So that, that will change three times in the next month, just kind of floats in and yeah, out. So you just right. caught it at the right time, I guess. That's, that's amazing. <laughs> and, and we'll, you know, we'll, we'll get into leadership and, you know, about the podcast, ABC, always lifting people up, being positive and things like yeah. that. So real quick, that thing actually started on a bet from your son. Did. Uh, my son, who's 17 now, Tate, uh, it was when he was 11, we're sitting on the couch and I was just rattling him off because I've been watching it since I was little. It was right. When it rained, I was inside watching either baseball or Wheel of Fortune. Right. And then I, I kept doing crossword puzzles and watching Wheel of Fortune while I was playing because it kept my mind sharp. And, right. you know, I always want to be thinking through because when we get tired or hungry, you, we tend your faculties come down a little bit. Exactly. And so I kept getting them and, and I'll give you the short version. But he said my son was sitting next to my wife and I was on the other side and he said, uh, Daddy, you need to let me let us have the last puzzle seriously because the the, it, the bell d- dinged and then you mm-hmm. could you know fifteen hundred dollars per or whatever it was and then they'd go one at a time so I went in the kitchen started chopping food up start chopping vegetables and making dinner and I there was only like three tiles left yeah. and I'm standing there just suffering like come on you got it and and then I just blurted it out and he stands up and he says that's it you're going to be on the show I'm like okay yeah he's like no right. I'm serious you got to make a video I'm like. And I said, you've done the research? My wife said, yes, he's done the research. 
and you're going to make a video. We were talking about it. So, okay, how many people send in a video? He said, eh, about a million. I said, what are those odds? <laughs> And it was a, it was more rhetorical. What are those right. odds? And he answered point no. zero 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 three percent. Okay, Tate. Yeah, he'd done the research. That's why he's my resident genius. But right. so the other thing I'd add is that we, I told him I would do it. A month later, he comes in from cross country practice and said, "Hey, did you do it yet?" And I said, "Do what? What, what did I do? What did I forget? He's like, did you make the video?" And you know, we, we try to teach those we love lead by example, right. teach integrity, all those things. And uh, he said, well, if you didn't do it, you're a promise breaker. Like, oh, 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 I could literally oh. feel the sword go through my, uh, my, my chest and back. And so we went upstairs, did a video. And then is the last part I'll say is after we recorded it on his iPad, it's a 30 second video. Right. And he said, okay, there's three things you need to remember before I hit send. Number one, you will be on the show. You need to understand that. Number two, you're taking me out of school because I'm going with you to California. And number three, because it's my idea, we have four people in the house. I want 25% of the winnings, the cash winnings. Oh, you're joking. No. He's, okay, no, so he was first, on it. But time out. Yeah. This is your son also who's really who does the gaming, yeah. who has turned that into like a business at 17. Almost a business, yeah. He, right. he goes, he'll go pro next year at 18. At 18. Yeah, so it tastes no joke. He's, yeah, he's he's no joke. I mean, like last night, our printer died. We had another printer. My wife, I was doing something else, so my wife said, Tate, you got to – you got to take a break in your game, get our printer set up. Right. She was fiddling around for about 45 minutes and he, in like 30 seconds, he had it all ready to go. Oh, and yeah, he's just a genius, but yeah. So, um, they ended up calling. I tried out in Kansas city when they came, they called me back. I made it, went out and you know, we won almost the won that trip to Costa Rica, which nice. was amazing. Wow. And <laughs> that was incredible, but, uh, almost 12 grand in cash. So no I had to put $3,000 in his account. And so straight up, he didn't I, let you forget. Oh, no. Well, I wouldn't have, cause right. I already blew it and told him I'd do it. And then right. I forgot. Right. Because, but that was my doubt. I didn't right. think he was going to do it. And it's amazing how, whether it's our brides, girlfriends, kids, especially little kids, how much they teach us and how accountable they keep us. And he didn't mean it in any kind of negative thing whatsoever. Mm. Like daddy, you're a promise breaker. It was, a joking thing, right? But behind it, it's like you decide whether you're going to keep your word or not. Right. And of course, he didn't say that. So right. yeah, I made it. Um, the day I found out I made it, I ran to. Uh, he was had a cross country meet. And he's standing by all his friends, and I didn't. I don't want to embarrass him, but I'm like, dude, you were you were right. I just got the call. I'm, right. We're going to California. I'm, I'm going to be on Wheel of Fortune, and he's standing there straight facing me. Right. Like I have friends here. Can we do this later? Right. And so I said, aren't you excited? And, and then he said, this is a great ending for this. He said, look, I told you you'd be on. You're taking me out of school. I want the money. And then he stone face says, and besides, daddy, I believe in you. Wow. Oh, I started bawling right there. I'll just see wow. at the finish line. I can't. Wow. So I took off and Kristen's like, just go, just go. And I'm standing there by myself sobbing. But it was a great time. And he made some money. That's so, an amazing story. Yeah. That's an amazing story. Well, that sounds comes straight from the parents. It sounds too, like right? that kid's got some pretty good parents. Yeah, exactly. he definitely has good mama. That's for sure. <laughs> right? And, you know, there's uh, the one thing I'd add is there's a lot of things I learned from that. But when I got there, I mean, you get a thousand dollars just for showing up. I mean, yeah. if you stink it up and you're I mean, my first two roles were bankrupt and lose a turn. OK. And the people one right and left, one had gotten one, one had right. gotten the other. I'm like, oh, well, there I we won't tell here. anybody when this is going to air. Right. Just let it go. <laughs> yeah. But. I remember I was the sixth one they taped that day, the sixth show. Wow. And that's because the guy that was on my team drew a number six. So we had to wait all day and watch every episode. We'd get there at 7 a.m. And it was like 5, 5.15 when we recorded. And I remember standing in the bathroom. I'm freaking out. And what are you going to do? Strategy and all this. And finally, I said, look, man, this is a once in a lifetime thing. You're panicking over something like this. Right. How about you just relax and enjoy this gift that you have to be able to do that? Right. And so... I ended up having fun because at the beginning I was kind of freaked out, but then I calmed down. And after, after that second puzzle, I ran the table the rest of the show and that's awesome, my son man. made three grand. That's amazing. <laughs> and I went to Costa that's, Rica with my wife. <laughs> well, there's a couple story. of lessons in there, but one of them, like when you said to the guy, let's just enjoy this for what it is. You know, I'm, this is an opportunity that most people don't get. Yeah. Like you can take that frame of reference and put it into just about anything. You can. Like, you know, if I'm stressing out this morning, making sure that our tech is working good for this podcast, right? And 
I'm freaking out. I'm waking up extra early to make sure that I get here and everything's going right. First of all, like we're hanging out with our buddy Les. Right. We're doing a podcast with best friends, getting to share some really cool stories with some friends. Like, yeah. chill out. This is fun. Most people don't get to do this. Let's just enjoy it. So I should have called you at three in the morning when <laughs> and you were awake. Well, too. Did, that's the thing about Bobby and I, and everyone should know. Like we're we're kind of perfectionists when it comes to certain things. You know, we're on the outside we seem like we're super chill and you know cool, which we are. But man, we want everything to like work out mm -hmm. great, and we don't want to disappoint anyone, right? right? So, but in what you guys do, though, you have to be meticulous. You, you got to right. be right on, and then combine that with really enriching and helping other people in right. their lives. And so it, it kind of all goes together, but people in life will learn lessons if they humble themselves and be open to learning those lessons. But if you think you know everything and if you think you got right. it and try to take control of everything, you end up kind of living in empty emptiness or you're anxious a lot or worried a lot. And so that's one of the many things I love about you guys is that you focus on helping other people. You focus right. on loving people. I mean, I think the last 10 conversations I've had with you guys, at some point we've talked about somebody else. Both of you are like, hey, how are you doing? How's your family? How are things going? To the point where I'm trying to ask you how you guys are and you keep asking me right. questions. Right. But but I think we both know that's what the world struggles with today is loving other people. And you yeah, guys sure. do that well, both in your personal lives and in your business. And I really appreciate that. No, we appreciate you. Thank man. you very well, much. And a lot of it is life lessons. You know, yeah. we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, maybe some lessons that you learn, you know, come up, coming up through the minor league. Mm -hmm. Some of the lessons that you learned being a big leaguer and, you know, how did that transcend to being a leader in the outside world, sure. you know, with uh, speaking and your faith and church and leading others. So there's so much into that. And the thing that Bobby and I always talk about is, you know, everyone has something going on in their lives, right? right? And especially the past couple of years, you always need more positivity, right? You need a foundation to go back to that know that everything's going to be okay. Yes. Right. Yep. So uh, that really helps us get through because no matter what business people are in, you know, you're going to go through struggles, but you have to be around like-minded people that's right. that are positive, they're going to lift you up. So on that day that you're not having your best day, you have your buddy Bobby that's going to bring you out or if Bobby's, you know, having a down day and vice versa. So that's that's what it's about, man. So we really appreciate you you being here. And speaking of which, so why don't you touch base a little bit on coming up through the ranks a little bit? Maybe was there a few lessons learned going through the minor leagues because, you know, we're all athletes you yes. know, Bobby and I wish we would have had one day at uh, one inning in a big, in a big league, <laughs> a you cup know, of coffee, coffee. <laughs> right? Exactly. Fancy camp doesn't count, but I mean, what it's was close some, though. It gets you close though. It gets, it gets you it close. It gets, but what was some of the lessons that learning coming up through the minor leagues? Great question. Uh, when I first signed, I'd never hit with a wood bat before and I, coming out of wow. college, my junior year, I was drafted by Boston mm -hmm. and was, okay. an, was an All-American, and we lost in the championship game of the NEI World Series, blew a five-run lead, by the way, 5 nothing, and blew it and gave up seven in the last three innings. But uh, it there was a part of me that I'm going to play in the big leagues. I'm going to be rich. I'm going to be famous. And my head was not – I wish I could say my whole life. It, it My head was screwed on straight. But I did not have a lot of humility. So the – I was drafted in the, the 23rd round by Boston and didn't sign. And, and the original offer was $2,000. I went to summer ball after like, well, I don't, for $2,000, I'm a junior. I've got the, I've got the power on my side here. Right. And, and I didn't have anybody in my life that was, I mean, my dad was gone. Um, I had a stepfather, but him and my mom were doing their own thing. And so it was just try to figure it out on your own. Right. So I didn't sign and went to, summer ball and was tearing it up and was winning the triple crown of, of summer baseball, the collegiate league in, in Illinois. And they upped it eventually to $30,000. But by then I had so hardened my heart and felt like I was so slighted that I said, Nope, no thanks. If you come back, don't come back and call me about baseball. We can talk, go to dinner, but don't talk to me about baseball unless you come back with 50 grand instead of 30 grand. Oh, wow. And that's pretty arrogant. That's really arrogant. Right. And, and you can feel free to agree when you're not. I mean, that's, right. I try to teach my kids lessons off of those mistakes. And so when I signed with the Royals the next year, and and I love that God has a sense of humor because the first amount that Boston gave me was 2000 right. up to, to 30. The only offer I got from Kansas city was 2000. Oh, yes. Wow. And so 
it was a message right there. Like, hmm, it's not about the money. It's not about you. So decide what you're going to do. Right. So I signed. I went out and there were guys like a second baseman. There's a guy like named David Haber who's our second baseman. And he he's from California. You got these Texas and Florida and Southern United mm-hmm. States guys that play year round. And I'm from Chicago. So you're getting 40 games in. Right. And some of it's in snow in you know March. Yeah. Right. And I had to learn how to hit with a wood bat because I was trying, if you squeeze it, you guys know this because you hit with wood even in fantasy camp. The harder you swing, the tighter you grip, it deadens the ball, you break bats, and that's not fun. Right. And I was struggling. I was hitting 169, and Tom Poquet was our manager, and I said, look, I'm playing sparingly. This is not how I thought it was going to work out. Obviously, there's a lot that I need to learn, so I am going to wipe out everything I know, and I'm going to do everything that you tell me to do because there's – there's not a whole lot worse than 169. Humility right. lesson number two. Right. Number two, humility yeah. lesson because I'm failing at baseball for the first time in my life since I was seven years old. Right. Never failed at baseball. I mean, yeah, you strike out, do things like that, but high school winning a state championship and uh, being on all-star teams and right. all, all that sure. stuff. Um, playing on the Olympic team yeah. after high right. school. All those things, and, and now all of a sudden, I'm back to the bottom of the barrel. But I feel like as a man of faith – I can't be the most moldable until I empty myself of me and right. think of other people. So I did everything that Tom Poquette taught me. And about a week later, um, I had gotten injured, but came back. And my first two at bats were outside fastballs. And I hit them over the right center field wall for home runs. Like So that's how this works. Right. Wow. Right. I got my average up to about 245. But uh, two big doses of humility right there. Mm-hmm. Um, learning to play for the name on the front instead right. of the name in the back. Love that quote. Yeah. It's, it's, Love that. Yep. Some people think it's cliche, but we all need to hear it. Yep. And so, yeah, then rising through the ranks, I went from getting injured, almost getting released, to three, three and a half years of that day of walking on the field, the stadium field at Kaufman for the first time. So right. a lot of humility. A lot of grind, learning how to take care of your body, um, showing self-control. You know what I mean? You always play with your body, but if you don't use your mind, it's going to fall apart. You have to be well-rounded in all those areas. And so, um, yeah, lessons were a lot of humility, taking care of yourself and understanding that you will be a better athlete when you stop thinking that it's just you Mm -hmm. instead of playing with and for the other 24 guys that are with you. That's an awesome answer because wouldn't you agree that, you know, baseball is such a humbling sport, right? Yes. One minute you're on top of the world and next minute the ball falls out of your glove, right? Mm -hmm. So don't you think that's pretty common with a lot of young athletes coming through the ranks? Because ever since elementary school, high school, college, all that, they're rock stars, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And then they come into the minor leagues, which is you and they're, know, and they're roadies, yourself, right? And they're roadies. <laughs> and you do that. That's a big check. And I think that's a lot of those guys who don't make that mental mind shift that probably the mental part of it keeps them in the minors and not making it to the big show. Right. There are millions of guys. Yeah. And, and my, my son's older team were a showcase baseball team. And, and this is their junior year, just finished up their junior year. So this is when they're going to get recruited. So now we're talking to college coaches and I keep telling them, over and over again, you know, you have to be humble. You have to work hard. Um, you you have to make sure that you build your character first mm-hmm. instead of just, you know, this game will humble you just because, you know, we have a shortstop that's really good. And I keep telling him, look, you're an excellent player. You're going to play in college as long as you stay healthy and keep your grades up. Right. The problem is what will separate you and make you successful is you have to understand there are 500,000 shortstops out there that are your height, your weight, you're slower, you do have power, but they're all wanting the same thing. And the thing that makes you different is when you move up, will you work hard? Will you stay passionate? And once you get there, will you have the emotional capacity to not let the game get surreal to you? So, so many guys are talented to play in the big leagues. So many guys. But the one thing that keeps most of them from getting there is that the game gets too big for them and they can't handle it mentally or emotionally. Well, I think that's a perfect transition to how that translates to any industry in the rest of life. Yeah. Right. And everyone can grow up and you can be talented and you can be smarter. But if you don't 
position yourself mentally and spiritually and physically, whether it's doing mortgages mm -hmm. or real mm -hmm. selling in real estate or working insurance. in insurance or anything or baseball, it doesn't matter. If you don't have mm -hmm. all those things working in harmony, mm -hmm. there is no possible way that you can live and feel fulfilled, not only succeed, but, but feel fulfilled. I think that's a big part of it. Yeah. So I'd like maybe you to jump into the, the conversation of when you started to go there, but you, I've heard you say this phrase several times and we say it too with our teams, but the, the phrase servant leadership. Yes. Um, I'd like for you to speak a little bit about what that means and how those lessons in the minor leagues and growing up and being humbled mm -hmm. brought you to, to that phrase and that mantra for the rest of your life. Well, I'll start with this saying servant leadership only comes when you have a change of heart. And we are, we're sinful creatures by nature. We're selfish creatures by nature. I mean, we're born in gimme, 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 gimme. I mean, my first word wasn't mama. It was no, right. no, no, no. I, so in, in servant leadership, a lot of people in this generation think, well, well servant leadership, but this, what about me? What am I going to get? What do I'm, what am I going to get to do? And, and they don't understand that when you serve other people, your relationships are exponentially better. Um, people's lives change. You're a people. My wife is so good at this. She's got this amazing discernment that you can say something about your character and who you are. And by the way, side note, if you have to say something good about yourself, chances are you might need to check out from the neck up because it's yeah. Right. If you live your life a certain way, people are going to recognize it. They're going to be affected by it. And that's where the servant leadership part comes in. I can give you a big list on a sheet of paper. And both of you can as well, because you've been doing this a while. We can have all these attributes of servant leadership on a piece of paper. We can get in front of people and we can read the list and you're supposed to do this. That's great. Giving people the information is only a microcosm mm -hmm. of what right. they need. Right. So people need to see you living out. When you say it, that's great, but that's only the first half of the equation. The second half is, does he or she live, live that it. out? They have exactly. to be able to live it out. And so whatever arena people are in, whatever their profession, there's dads, there's moms, there's brothers, there's sisters. Leading is a big calling, but servant leading isn't about giving up your rights. It's just about caring and listening and loving other people. And then you have to tie the bow around that of living your life based on how you speak, because if the two don't match up, then people eventually aren't going to give you the time of day. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It makes me think about lots of companies, lots of you walk into an office and you see motivational things, you know, or like think back to the eighties when everybody had like that golf mural with like a quote of like, if you, you miss the shots, you know, like the Wayne Gretzky yeah, quote, that's right. right. Anyone can have of the shots, you know, right, exactly. Anybody can have those, those quotes up on their wall or we can have core values and everything mm -hmm. around, around our office. Right. But if we don't live those core values every single day, and in fact, if we don't live through those core values with every single conversation, mm -hmm. right. With every single person that walks through this door, team members, guests, you know, borrowers, clients, right. then we're liars, you know, and, and right. we're, we're fake. Well, and like we say, everyone's always watching. That's right. You know, I remember when I became a parent the first time people were telling me mm. they will always be watching you mm -hmm. and they don't miss anything. That's right. And it's the same thing. I don't care what type of business that you're in, but like for us, you know, what we've done a very good job of is, you know, as you, you know, we took you through a tour of the office mm -hmm. and you see all of our different sayings, the ABCs and the TNTs, it takes no talent, but the people that we are think we're servants to are always watching us. That's right. So when we lay a certain, you know, level of this is what we expect and everything like that, if we have someone on the team that doesn't meet those expectations and if we don't address that or mm -hmm. if we just let it slide, you have the, it, the rest of the group that's looking at that and is like, oh, they really don't mean that though, do they? Yeah. Right. So we've had some tough conversations, but again, that's the reason why, you know, over the years we've been successful is because you set those expectations. But like you said, Les, you have to live those out. You do. And it's a, isn't it a lot easier, gentlemen, to to live free instead of being fake? Oh, my gosh. You know I mean, the lie after the lie. I mean, you, you if you live that way where you, you don't live it out, but you talk it, talk it, talk it, you yourself, the very core of who you are, gets buried in all the fake and the lies and the smoke screen you're putting up right. there. And, and I call it the perfect masquerade. Mm -hmm. You know, you're trying to be this perfect person. But but again, if you're not living it out, not serving other people, that's a tough life because more and more you get anxious. It's, right. it's an old Judge Judy saying, 
don't lie because then you don't have to worry about what you forgot. Right. So, oh God. It's yeah, true. it's, it, it is so true. So they are watching yep. and some people will think, Oh, that's, I never asked for that. Well, if you became a father, like you said, you, you kind of asked for that, even if you didn't use the words. Right. Um, I'm just proud of the fact that I have a 20, almost 21 year old son and a 17 year old son. And they both call me daddy still. They don't say dad. They don't say, yo, you know, <laughs> Hey old man, you know, they probably think it sometimes, but right. to be able to call, me that and my wife and I talk about this a lot because we've always been open with them and shown them grace consequences but with grace but the idea has been to lead them I can tell them all I want but they're at the age now that they're they understand yeah. and they won't follow the things that I teach them if my life doesn't match what I say right. so yeah it's super important in life in business in friendships and everything that's a that's a perfect transition to what you do with breaking the norm and what you do with some of your coaching. So you take some of those lessons. I imagine we'd like you to speak that with you, what you do with your sons, right? Yes. Um, you know, I watch your your videos on Facebook that you do with your group. Then you lead men. Mm -hmm. Why don't you talk a little bit about, about that yeah. and what it's meant to you and what it's meant to the, the gentleman in particular? I know you have lots of listeners, females, males, but why don't you speak a little bit about what you do for leading men. Sure. The break in the norm show was just born out of 12 years, gosh, 12 years already, but 12 years ago, I was just listening to radio, just listening to sports radio. And it was negative, negative, negative. Right. And they were hammering on these people. And, and I really, even if it was wrong who they were talking about, or maybe they did something that, that wasn't right. It was a moral failure or character, lack of character. That's still a human being. Right. And they're not there to defend themselves. And, it's how I learned to forgive my dad because my dad was super abusive when I was a kid, left when I was 12, never saw him again. Wow. And so I carried that pain all the way through to my mid thirties until I went to counseling and someone said, have you ever considered what your dad went through? And that unlocked it for me right. to, to learn about other people. What some people might do is not okay, but you can maybe help them. Number one, understand it. But then number two, you can learn to be compassionate and show sympathy and it, most people know they're hiding or they're in pain or something like that. And right. so um, I used a lot of those father wounds to lead men because there are so many of us mm -hmm. out there that have wounds, but you know, we're big, we're tough, we're athletes, right. we're professionals in business. Down, right? Oh yeah. yeah. Well, yeah. people don't need to see my junk. They're not interested and I'm tough and I can handle it. Well, from age 12 to like 38, I wasn't handling it at all. Right. And my wife saw it and she said, Hey, you probably should talk to someone. There's no joy. So, I, instead of being that victim, I'm going to play that victor role. And I, it's interesting. People say, Oh, do you forgive your dad? Aren't you mad at your dad? I do forgive him. And if he was alive, I'd hug him and say, Hey, I get it. I don't even say it. I wow. get it because I had to learn that my dad uh, didn't know his dad, that my dad was abused by his mom. And he was also, she was an alcoholic and he was left alone and didn't have any skills. He didn't go to college. He was kicked out of his house. So my dad, my biological father gave me an incredible gift. And besides God, I credit him for showing me what not to do. Now he didn't know he was doing it, right. but everything my dad did wrong, I did the opposite. And so I've got healthy, God-fearing, intelligent, loving, friendly, humble children, also because of their mother. But I've been able to learn those lessons and show them that mercy and grace. And so through my radio show, I wanted it to be positive. Just let's just go with positive stories. We don't right. need negative because right. there's enough negative in the world. Oh, yeah. As soon as you turn your phone on, your computer, your TV, whatever it may be, conversations uh, on the radio, conversations in the mall or at the store. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to be positive with the radio show and it was a one month experiment. And then here we are 12 years later <laughs> and on the coaching men, uh, Men are called to be the leader of their home, biblically. Now, that doesn't mean they're the boss of their home. Right. Trust me. <laughs> yeah, my bride, that. My bride yeah. carries more weight in my house. She's only 95 pounds, but right. she carries more weight in my house than anything. Right. But there are so many men out there that, that their wives or their future wives are waiting for them to step up and be a strong leader. Not be perfect, but be yeah. a strong leader. Just to step in, to lean in, to learn, to grow, to admit their mistakes and be humble. And so I teach that through men's coaching. I help their minds get decluttered, help right. them get organized, uh, come 
to the table and, and try to learn to be humble so you can talk to it and break down those walls. In the servant leadership, I do some servant leadership consulting for some different companies. And we do uh, six sessions. So it's one three-hour session a month for six months. And people come into those a little skeptical because they say, or they hear servant leadership. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay, what am I going to have to do? My rights are gone. Mm-hmm. All right, here we go. But the first three sessions are all about how to become the best version of yourself. And you do that by investing in yourself. That's not selfish. Because if I'm if I'm anxious, if I'm angry, if I'm frustrated, and I take that out on my wife and my kids, right. but I'm, I'm going in the opposite direction. I'm hurting their heart. I'm not leading. And so... It, it helps them to become better, not by my judgment, but themselves. They can see that they're more than what they think they are. Every Behind every face, there's a drama unfolding. We're all hiding. Right. So in men's coaching, in the radio show, and in the servant leadership consulting I do, it's helping people see their worth, their value, and then living their life out along that vein versus trying to live up to something that they can't even live up to in their own mind and heart. And that's what breeds the anxiety and the fear and lack of self-control. Well, that, that, you know, that turning point of almost giving people permission to be vulnerable to let things out goes Mm -hmm. back to the thing, you know, your wife saying, Hey, Les, you know, why don't you go talk to someone about that? Yeah. And that literally, like you said, unlocked everything and completely changed your life. Right. Yeah. That's when the joy started. Yeah, Yeah. absolutely. Absolutely. That's wild. I mean, you've said a couple of big things that I think we should touch on. Mm-hmm. Um, but the idea that you can't take care of others unless you've taken care of yourself. Mm-hmm. I think that's a huge point that a lot of people miss. And I think a lot of, um, let's say parents in particular with young children, they get so caught up in serving their, their children and the young people in their homes mm-hmm. that a lot of times they forget to take care of their spouse take care of themselves. Right. 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 And the and kids become the sole focus. I think a lot of people can relate to that ideal. Um, and then their marriages suffer, their relationships suffer, their work suffers, taking care of their, their physical self, their mental self. Um, that, that's really important to take care of yourself so that you can, you can take care of others. Yeah, right? exactly. Absolutely. It is. Yeah. And, and the thing is what, you know, a lot of couples, you know, you got to be husband and wife first, mm-hmm. right? You're going to be mom and dad for, you know, a really highlighted, you're always going to be a mom and dad. Right. But when they turn 18, as you know, or 22 and they move on, mm-hmm. you know, I remember going through high school and seeing a lot of my friends' parents split after high school. Right. Because they just became after, parents. Yeah. Right. And then right. they didn't have anything in common and they kind of went away. But, you know, I'm listening to this whole conversation and, uh, you know, how fortunate your sons are because, mm-hmm. man, if we could all go back in time yeah. and be a young man and have someone, a, a mentor or a parent or someone at church say, hey, it's not all about you, mm-hmm. right. right? It's not all about you. It's about other people and helping them. And, you know, like you said, it's all about the name on the front of the jersey. Yeah. You know, interesting and real quick, there was a guy that uh, he was on the school board where I grew up. And, and this is after my dad left and my mom wasn't around much. My sister was off doing her thing. So I dove into sports. And so diving into baseball, I was still an angry kid, you know, no father figure around, just right. angry, angry, not trusting guys. And there was a guy that came to a game. I, I got like three hits in the game, but I struck out twice. It was a long game, had five at bats. And so after the game, I was mad. Again, you know, you're 15, 16. Mm-hmm. I'm not too far removed and right in the angry, I know everything, leave me alone stage. Right. So he comes up to me after the game and said, hey, Les, uh, my name is Chuck. I'm on the school board. And I said, yes, Mr. Kuchar, I know who you are. Uh, and he said, hey, I want you to know you had a great game. Did you not see the two strikeouts? And so I wanted to assume on him that I had a bad game. He's like, no, I just, and he had two sons. Right. But he was there watching our game. Right. And a couple times in high school and basketball, he would keep score. He would just show up at games. But I, And I knew both of his sons. But he always encouraged me with little things, never a conversation or something like that. So fast forward to May 29th of 1995. I get called up. And the, the next night we're at home in Kansas City, I joined him on the road in Milwaukee, but the next night we came to Kansas City. So in the seventh inning, I went into left field at Kaufman as a defensive replacement. And in the mid nineties, we were kind of like things are going now, probably a little bit worse. <laughs> right. And you probably could hear the fans in the stands. Well, that's the whole point right? because I looked up and down the left field line, there was nobody there except one guy. Some throwing my warm up tosses, just looking around and all of a sudden I see some guy sitting by himself. And he's going, 
just waving at me. And fans do that, especially sure. the college kids who yeah. are a little bit happier than when the game started. <laughs> and uh, uh, I look and I'm like, you got to be kidding me. And it was Chuck. Wow. The same guy. He read in the paper that I just got called up, immediately booked a flight just to show up to let me know that he was there for me. No. Now I'm 26 now. It's, you know, it's all these years later. It's right. 11 years later. Right. But he didn't tell me he was coming. We hadn't talked in a month or so, occasional phone call. Right. But that's the that's the leadership stuff we're talking about. Wow. That's the love and the care. And I'll never forget it because my biological father didn't see it. And my stepdad had come to a game or two, but it was a different relationship. But yeah, man, Chuck just showed up. That's right, because he over. wasn't living in Kansas City. No, he, he lived back in Joliet, in Illinois. Illinois. Shout out to Chuck. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah you know, last week we uh, we did a show with Duke and Dina and we talk and we did a show the week before just DC and I talking about um, the people that have made lasting impressions on our lives mm -hmm. and you know we we both grew up also in in at some point broken homes right mm -hmm. and parents split up well it's common isn't it That's it really common. is common and actually which is a little scary how closely aligned you and I are the 12 to to 38 thing um, we we can talk a little bit about that later but uh, having especially for people that do have broken homes, having those people that you can gravitate to that, you know, you can count on mm -hmm. to uplift you actually DC and I, we have an expression. We have lots of expressions, but we have an expression about the people that lift us up. We call them elevator people. Yeah. And you want to surround yourself with more elevator people and less or fewer basement people. That's right. right. People that pull you down to the basement just because they need the company because they're hanging out down low. Yeah. And so we tried to always obviously be elevator people for others, right. but not only that, but surround ourselves with other elevator people, people to where we look up to them. Mm -hmm. And essentially, you know, even though we're in our forties, right. You know, we still look for guidance. We still look for positive people right. to make sure that we can be led so that we can continue to lead people and always be positive. That's a perfect example of humility, understanding we will become who we hang out with. We will oh become gosh. who we spend the most time with. Maybe the most valuable long. lesson ever. Absolutely. And and, and it, at the right stage, at the right time, I was teaching both of my sons, what type of person are you? And they'd tell me. I said, okay, what type of person are your friends? The two or three people you hang out with the most. Right. And then I would ask them, do those two match? And both times it was, well, not really. Mm -hmm. And so I let them know, go look in the mirror, Look at the person that you are and let's think about why you're that way. And the number one reason is because of the people you surround yourself with. Right. And and I have to preach that too to myself. I've got to right. look in the mirror and do that as well. Again, people like you lift me up. So it's right. we can all do that for each other. So it, it is so unbelievably important to make sure you do that. It, it is. One of the things that we always like to do, whether it's here or our buddies or you know, Royal's Famous Camp, which is literally one of the best things that we've ever done, is we always tell people, Hey, we're going to be on the sidelines with pom poms cheering you on, mm, right? That's like, right. Let's go, yeah. right? Because you know you just don't hear that enough, uh, and uh, we we take pride as giving the because as far as like partners or whether they are work for us or whatever, they just want to be around that, yeah. right? And people want to be around leaders that have that servant uh, leadership, and uh, you no, know, it's uh, you know talk about and we can talk about a little bit about, about Royals fantasy camp, but literally one of the best things and. In fact, we try to invite as many of our buddies to that mm -hmm. event that you guys do such an amazing job on because that right there, I think, is a life changing event for a lot of the guys that come. Because, again, you're surrounding yourselves with other people who are like man, like minded, who are positive. They think it's about baseball, but it's really about the fellowship and the people and the friends that you meet over over the years. And sometimes right? some and you guys have been there enough, so you get it right away. But first year or second year guys at fantasy camp right. don't realize it till they're on the plane on the way home. Oh yeah. Oh, or when they oh, get yeah. home right. and they're thinking, I, I, I miss those guys. Oh, oh man, yeah. I want to hang and they stay in touch. And these right. you know, miles across the country don't separate the relationships that are built oh, my during fantasy camp. I mean, we're, we're going to weddings. We're mm -hmm. going, unfortunately we're going to funerals yeah, uh, of that's, parents that's and things like right. that. Um, in fact, this is probably a good, uh, point to show one of my favorite pictures. It was my second year of fantasy camp. This is awesome. <laughs> Do you know what it is? Um, I, I, I think I'll recognize it when I see it. Right. I All right. It. So here we go. This, this is my favorite. Picture. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> so make sure you. Yeah, that's outstanding. Right? I didn't fantastic. know you had that. 
Oh. I sure do. <laughs> Second year of fantasy yeah, camp. Oh, man, that's awesome. Fortunate enough to make a good catch, and Mr. Les Norman comes off that's the field and awesome. jumps, jumps in my arms. But, yeah, man, that's hanging downstairs over our bar. Oh, man. And my wife, you know, you know Chili Pepper, who you know, yeah. she's like, oh, my gosh, you've got to take that that's is awesome. Les, Dude, right? I love that. Isn't that's that amazing? amazing? Yes, right? I love that. That's outstanding. I'm glad that's, I didn't break your back. I know, right? <laughs> it looks like you were leaning back like I got a running start. <laughs> well, I was a few years younger, so. Yeah, right. We all, we all were. Right? right? Exactly. Yeah, yeah I think that's a great point in that, uh, like, personally, uh, I'll be honest, complete vulnerable moment. Um, when I got back from camp the first time, first of all, we went from camp straight to the Super Bowl for the Chiefs, right? So there right. was like an extra three it's days a, of a fun year there of elation, it's right? A great ten days. Yeah. But getting back and um, like so often do when, when great things end, right? That's when you can re- reflect. Um, but I, I was emotional. I, mean, I was home and I was thinking about. Of course, you think about the baseball. I said this on stage last year. Mm -hmm. I went for the baseball, and then it became about everything else. And baseball, like, literally gets pushed to the bottom of the list. And being able to hang out today with you and being able to, um, like DC said, go to weddings, go to, you know, funerals. Like, even though that's such a sad thing. That's right. a special thing that we are there to support one another mm-hmm. through major life events. Right. Like that's a, it's a fraternity. It's yes. a fellowship. Yeah. It's, and it's not like the fraternity a, in terms of like, you know, party. college and party and right. like, we're going to hang out and get wasted. It's a fraternity for a lifetime of brotherhood and love. Mm-hmm. It's just absolutely special. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. You, you had Dina on and Duke, we did. And right. this is one thing that I don't think Dina understands how well, done fantasy camp is and how good it, it is for everybody you know she's doing it to make everybody having this incredible experience right, right. and she does it every time there is no one better than dina blevins at Hands getting up. at her job now and her job in fantasy camp right. but what i hope dina realizes is is that in all of our whether you're an alumni or a camper that goes to fantasy camp all these relationships all these memories that are created Dina has her thumbprint on it. Yeah, all, She's part of the dominoes that fall to the end. And so, you know, she, all of those listening, if you know Dina, send her an email, send her a text, give her a shout out because right. she just maybe feels like I'm, I'm just doing the very best job. We all know how hard she works down right. there. She loses sleep. She's a mom of two active young daughters right. and has had her trials and in, in, in tragedies in life. But there are people that will be friends forever and share and be able to surround themselves with the people, those elevator people. She's facilitating that. So, Dina, if you're listening, uh, we love you. And we we couldn't have this stuff that we do without you. Literally. Literally. We've made some of our best friends in life straight from that. That's it. There was a a, a topic you said earlier that I thought was really, really profound. Um, When people go through negative things in life, yeah. trials and tribulations that we all have. Like you said, every behind every face is a drama unfolding. Is a drama unfolding. You said that your dad leaving, he gave you a gift. Huge gift. And I'd like for you to expand on that because when people go through really rough times and the first thing is not to say, and obviously it wasn't your first thing when you said either, right? Um, it took you decades mm-hmm. to, to, come up with that philosophy, but for people to go through something so challenging and difficult, and then to be able to shift your mind to say, thank goodness that happened to me so that I could grow from it. Mm -hmm. Like, holy cow. Yeah. That's heavy. Yeah. If you ask the majority of people about their character, about themselves, they'll tell you good things. They may say a flaw too, Sure, but most of them will say good things because they don't want to look bad. They want we want as a human, as a human being, we want people to like us. We want to be uh, in someone's favor. Not that we want anything from them, but we want to be looked good upon. We right. don't want to be right. cast aside. Don't and one, yeah, yeah. One of the fears, this innate fear we have is the fear of being alone, not accepted, measuring up, especially us guys, even at the age that we're at. I mean, I'm 53 and I still have that. Am I enough? Am I, am I doing okay? And so, I, I, again, I had to really realize through some counseling how to look at people that hurt me, people that harm me and, and know that I'm enough because of who I was created to be, not what someone like my dad, whom I 
trusted and everything uh, says I am or lived out that I was, I mean, he called me worthless, a worthless PC. You know what? Uh, you know, I'd build Lincoln logs in the middle of the floor and he would practice his extra points. He'd sneak up behind me and just kick it and shatter it across the room. And, and I have an older sister, so I'll just say that I got it the easiest in our house. She got it, the, her and my mom got it the worst. So learning the life lesson of being able to humble yourself really unlocks the door for healing it unlocks the door to, and, and being humble is not being less than. It's not that you're less than somebody else. Right. Being humble is just leaving yourself open and know, hey, I've made mistakes, I fail, people have hurt me, but it doesn't have to end there. It doesn't define who I am. And so just learning about my dad's background, helping me understand right. what he had to go through, that he battled life wasn't enough. Once I became aware of that, it became my responsibility to lift up a legacy that he blew. He didn't have a good legacy, but if I tear him down my whole life and his memory, what good does that do anybody? Because his blood runs through my son's veins. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. They never met him. Right. They only know. And if I go to my son's, just continue your, your grandfather, your biological grandfather was this big jerk and mm -hmm. don't ever think positive about him. I'm teaching my children to hate somebody that makes mistakes. I'm taking gr the ability to share grace right. and compassion and sympathy away from them. Now, I also have to tell them, well, this is what he did. And so these are the consequences of right. it. You know, sure. he, he was an alcoholic and blind and had cirrhosis of the liver right. because of drinking so much. And he ended up sometime trying to cross a road in the middle of the night, got hit by a car and was killed. Oh my. It was down in Texas. I didn't know about it until three, four years later because he didn't, he didn't call any of right. us. Right. But again, it simply comes down to um, understanding who you are, understanding whose you are, and not playing that, that victim all the time. No matter what the negative things that happen to you, something good can come out of it if right. you're willing to, to search down that road. Well, and also you're teaching your sons because if, if you're to continually, you know, put down your dad, you know, psychologically, they're like, well, that's my grandfather and I have the same blood. Yeah. So what does that do to me? Am mm -hmm. I less than now too? Right. Right. Oh, yeah. And and also I'm sure there's some compassion in there, even though he was obviously not a good father, but he never had someone step in to be a role model right. that could turn that switch for him to stop that probably generational handing down. Absolutely. Of abuse, right? That's a great call to see. Yeah. Right. Again, people will ask me, how can you say you forgive your dad? Or when I say something, like I said earlier, like I wouldn't change a thing and I wouldn't, I wouldn't change one smack, one whip of a tree branch, nothing, none of those words, because, you know, we would do anything for our kids. We would do anything for our spouses, anything for the people that we love. I would do anything for my boys. And if that means my dad didn't get it right, but I'm the bridge for them to get it early on and to think back and mom and dad cared. They loved me. Dad mm -hmm. coached me. He taught me. He was, when I failed, he didn't cast me aside. He showed me grace. He taught me through it, but he never stopped loving me. You know, those are the, the valuable lessons. So I was plucked out of its generation, allowed to become a bridge. So my sons can be the start of a new generation. So the dominoes that fall after my sons right. are going to, there's where the whole good legacy is going to leave. And so cool. if I had to go through that, so my future grandkids right. and great grandkids can live. Uh, sorry for the emotion, but wow, that just came out of nowhere. But it's worth it all. It's worth every second of it. Bro, that's like literally one of the most powerful things ever, man. It, it's not about, you know, being an awesome show host and a former major leaguer and stuff. Like that's the real stuff yeah. is leaving the legacy and having those dominoes for generations, you right. know, even when we're long gone, mm -hmm. you know, you're leaving, you know, that legacy of generations that you're affecting families, you know, decades down the line, dude, that's, yeah. that's epic. I man. think there's Kudos a, there's a less Norman quote that sums up everything that you just talked, talked about. And it's, I used the wrong roadmap to find the right places. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Wow. Yeah, absolutely. Like that, mean, that's a quote that's on your website. It is. And I don't know if that's an original Les Norman quote. I had never read it or heard it before. Right. And I didn't get it from anywhere. I just, it was something that came well, to my instantly mind. Instantly when I think people hear that or read that, I mean, at least I did. I immediately started thinking about all the shit that went wrong in my life. Right. right. And help, how it helped me get to where I'm at today. Absolutely. And I was like, Oh wow. Like that roadmap was really messed up. 
but I'm in a pretty good place now. Mm -hmm. I'm in the good, I'm in a good place. I'm in the right place. Right. And the roads, it's not easy to get down that road to get to that place. It is really tough because we are, we were victims at the time and, and we got treated poorly and abused in some way or made feel some negative emotions. So there is counseling that maybe need to happen or uh, just years of, of just recovering from it and learning from it. But uh, again, if you can get to a point where you get that help and, and you really can get to the other side of it, there is not an ounce of me. I mean, if someone were to someone that knew my dad were to talk him down, it would it would be borderline. OK, we're going to fight right. because, <laughs> right. well, w- wait a minute. He did all those things to you. Yeah. But he was still my dad. And if you look at my kids and, and see how they are, he showed me, you know, I, I can get to California with a map of Rhode Island. It just shows me to head in the opposite direction. Right. So let's let me ask you this. So for some of the listeners that, you know, this is really resonating with or maybe there's some people out there that have some things that they would like to work through. Like, what would you suggest? Where would you point them in terms of getting with someone or or life coaching or something like Mm -hmm. what would you suggest they do? Because, again, this can completely change people's lives. And kudos to you, man. You are like the definition of ABC. (laughs) Always always be cool, cool, man. So what, what would you say to those folks? Well, we do this exercise. Uh, this all started, uh, I interviewed a guy on my radio show and he was one of the original American gladiators, like way back. Oh, yes. Nice. Yeah. And so nice. by the end, one of the questions that I like is, is I want, I'm trying to make the listeners think about who they are, look past what's in the mirror and, and get inside the brain and get inside the heart and start laying those things like just a deck of cards, one at a time, lay them out on the table. You don't have to throw all 52 out right away, get a couple of them. And then the next day, get a couple more. And so at the end of the show, I asked him, I said, when you look in the mirror, not the physical, because he's 6'5", 320, and it's all (laughs) yokedness. So um, yokedness. So I said, when you look in the mirror, what do you see? And this 6'5", 320 pound former superstar started crying on the air. And this is when I was doing these shows live. Right. So we ended the show and I talked to him and it, it was at that moment that I realized, man, there are people out there that not because I say so, but for their own health and their families and their loved ones health need to get, need to strip that junk down, need to get through the layers. And so one of the things we do in the servant leadership in these businesses is I'll put one of the people, everybody's got to go through it, mm-hmm. hand them a box of Kleenex, put them in a chair facing me while all their peers are sitting around them, but they can't look at them. They can only look at me. Right. And I asked them, so, okay, not what you see physically, but when you look in the mirror, what do you see? And every one of them loses it. I've had grown wow. men start crying before I even ask the question because they've been watching other people. Right. And, and they so, anticipate it. And they yep. anticipate and they yep. go, oh, man, now I got to be vulnerable, but we don't just leave them there. So they'll tell me they'll break down and they'll strip it. And they feel like, oh my gosh, I'm a crying mess. And I can't believe I just said all that. And then I turn the chair around and one by one, all the people Mm -hmm. around them get to say something to affirm them. So it's the mirrors and speak life exercise. And it is a 100% success rate because people will seek counseling. That's a success. People will start to listen, not in a arrogant way, but you know, I do have something to offer. I I do have people that love me. I have elevator people right Right. here in the office that will Mm -hmm. lift me up. And so, um, in, in that coaching, I'm just trying to help these people understand through that exercise that they're going to be okay, that right. they are valuable, they are worthy, and it's not you are not based on what someone says about you or what someone did to you that hurt you, even some of those consequences that you might still have to deal with, whether it's financial or right. emotional or whatever. And then to tie that whole thing up, it's not about what they say. It's not about what happened. It's about who you were created to be, and you have more of a choice to mold that than somebody else and what they say. I think, uh, wow, that's awesome. I think the poster that's around our office, the one that's right behind you right now, DC summarizes that exactly. Um, I noticed that when we came in right there. Yeah. yeah, I love that. That's all about three of them. We do. It's our constant reminder to ourselves, you know, because we're vulnerable Mm -hmm. and, um, not everyone is, not everyone's our champion, cheering, right? Yeah, not, not, everyone's right. For us. not everyone's cheering for us. And so it's a reminder that sometimes when we feel a little beat up or we don't feel worthy, that, uh, you know, we're strong and, you know, lions don't really care about sheep's opinions. And that's, I know some people don't really like that quote, but if you've got somebody that's trying to tear you down, 
that's not a supporter. That that's a sheep, and a lion really does not give two thoughts mm-hmm. about that sheep's opinions. Right. Well, and again, it's protecting who you have in your life. Right. Right. Yeah. Have those elev- elevator people Absolutely. around lifting you up all the time. And, so. and DC, you'd mentioned something a little while ago too about the whole dynamic of of kids and raising kids. When my kids got to age twelve, that was the magic age that I started to say this. That when they cross their mother, that okay, now you're not disrespecting your mom. Right. You're disrespecting my wife, and so they have to understand that mama came first, and right. that's another manhood lesson that mm-hmm. we've learned. And so if they say something and a little sarcastic or snippy, right. all I need to do is lean in, like really. Like, oh, oh, mom, I'm sorry. That's your yeah, teammate. Yeah. That's, that's your teammate. I, I, absolutely. And, and right. she's a lot better looking than some of my older teammates too. <laughs> right. So, yeah, it's again, it's just that lesson, like you said, uh, it, DC, it's about um, protecting those that we love that are in our home. And right. uh, I, I love that quote. Lions do not right. care about sheep's opinions. Oof, that's right. so good. I'm going to awesome. get me one. Right. Right. Yes. Hey, you know, we probably can help with that. We might right. ha- actually, like, yeah, <laughs> right. We'll, we'll look into that. We That's cool. That. Well, yeah. why don't we, why don't we pivot a little bit and yeah. um, we're, we're getting close to the end. So why don't we talk about some funny stuff? Like maybe you can share some <laughs> funny stories or share a funny story about your time in the bigs or your time in the minors or fantasy camp or just something that involves something that always makes you smile when you think about baseball. Right. Yeah. Um, the first one I think that comes to mind right away is the day I got called up. I got set up by, and usually there's a little trick that happens, but I got set up by the entire Royals organization and it was, it like was you got punked. I got punked Did you? hard. Yes. Really? So we're in, we're That's in, awesome. yes. yeah, let's go. So we're in AAA. We're in Omaha and Mike Jersley, the former Royals yeah. third base coach was our manager. Oh, nice. And I can't remember who we were playing, but we were, it was like the sixth inning and we were just laying it to this other team. I mean, I think, I had four hits that game. The guy behind me had five hits that game, and it's only the seventh inning. And there's no 10 run rule in pro baseball. <laughs> right. Let's keep so, going. yeah, we once won a game in Nashville 25 to five that took five hours. I went six for eight that game and was only the third best hitter in our lineup. Wow, somebody gosh. went seven for eight, and somebody went eight for eight, and we hit like 13 home runs as a but team. But didn't it, it feel ridiculous. good, though? Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Awesome. That was now, so sad. Yeah. Now I've been, I've been, or I've been many times. It seems like I'm patting myself on the back there, but I've been on the other side of that yeah, many times. So you yeah. got to enjoy them. Right. So uh, we're in Omaha. There's two outs and leading off first base. And again, we're up by 10, 15 runs. You're not, we're not going to steal. Right. Right? We're wearing these guys out. And so Keith Hughes is up and he lines out, but I just did a secondary lead, two outs. I round second. Guy catches it. Okay. We're out of the inning. So I get to third base and I hand my helmet and my gloves to, to Jersh. I'm playing right field. Hughes is playing center or flip flop. I'm in center. Hughes is in right. And I said, Keith, did you see a sign by chance? Because when I got to Jersh, he's like, did you see the hit and run? I'm like, shut up, dude. In, in a friendly way. I'm like, right. shut up, man. Come on. We're up like 12, 15 runs. You're not giving no hit and run. You right. start a brawl. Right. And he had the straight face like he wasn't kidding. I'm like, are you serious? Dude, there's no way, but let's talk about it after the inning. So I go out and I said, Keith, we're playing catch right. uh, to warm up. I said, did you get a hit and run sign from Jersh? And he said the same thing I said. We're up 15 runs. It, he didn't give a hit and run sign. Right. So I made a beeline for Jersh after that inning was over. I mean, straight to him, like, Husey said the same thing. You didn't give a hit and run sign. And he said, Husey couldn't find his you-know-what with a, <laughs> and if he were in a paper bag. He doesn't know. And he was getting mad. And so now I'm getting mad because I know he didn't give the hit and run sign because of the baseball unwritten rules. Sure, right. And what I didn't realize, though, is I wanted to fire back on him. But in the dugout is our minor league coordinator in town, Joe Jones. Uh, Duke was in there. Okay. So he was the roving pitching guy. Our head uh, scout was in the dugout and then like two other big wigs that were roving guys in the organization. Some brass and right. huge brass. And I, I, by this time I was doing really well, but I didn't think I was getting called up yet. Right. So this is in May. So the game is over. We're all hooping, hollering, big win. I'm literally don't get a word don't, or don't get a visual here, but I'm getting undressed. My pants, my sliding shorts, my jock and cup are on, but I'm, my pants are down around my ankles. I'm getting ready to get in the shower. Right. And Jersh slams the door to his office, and everybody's like, whoa. What the? It's like, Norman, get in here. And I'm thinking, he's still mad about that? I know he – I'm a – And you a, missed the sign? I'm a grown man. I know he didn't do that. Right. And so I come back with this little smart aleck. I'm like, 
well, my pants are on my ankles. I mean, can you wait till I get undressed or do you need me to come in? I mean, I have to shower. What do you need, Skipper? It's like, that mouth is going to get you in trouble someday, son. Get in my office right now. And everybody's looking around like, what in the world's up with that dude? You got to be in. Jersh is loved not like by that, so many. Right? He's yeah. not like that at all. Right. I'm thinking, is he just showing off for the brass, or is he gonna? Is he like worried about getting fired? Whatever. Right. Great. I'm the scapegoat. I don't have any big league time. I've got no bargaining power here, and I'm doing this for like twenty four hundred dollars a month. You got to be kidding me! Before taxes. So I I turn the corner in his office. There's an empty chair in the middle of the room, and all the brass is sitting in a semicircle oh, around the empty chair. And Jersh sits down and slams the door behind me. Thinking, well, this was this career was this fun. Was fun. This was fun. Yeah, it was fun. That was good. This will be a great finishing story for someone down the road. Uh, I'll just, I'll just pay my ticket to go to. Big so you League thought you're being straight up cut? I thought I was getting released. Wow. Now again, I'm hitting 380. Yeah, playing right. every day. So maybe they just didn't like my attitude. You're I don't confused. know. I was, I was severely confused. Yeah. No little about it. <laughs> so I sit down and say, Jersh, let me start by apologizing. I'll be honest with you. I think I'm right about the sign thing. <laughs> However, I'm going to apologize, say, but you're wrong. I'm going to apologize in my passive aggressive way to say, you're a jerk, you're wrong, but I'm sorry. Right. So again, a okay. little lack of humility there, a yeah. little lack a of little understanding. Right. But I said, but the way I came at you, especially in front of our team, was very disrespectful. I did not follow the chain of command. I should have just listened and talked it out, but listened first. The greatest example of a servant leader listens first. Start with why. Yeah. Yes. So, uh, I said, uh, said, that's, that's all I have to say. I'll take whatever punishment you have. And he looks at me and he says, well, that's, that's a good thing. You're taking that stance because tomorrow in Kansas city, if you do that, they're going to, you'll end up right back here. I said, yeah, you know what? You're right. Wait, what? Say that again. Like. This was a joke. I know I didn't give you a hit and run sign. We just all, and then they all start laughing. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And he's like, and he just pushes the phone forward and said, you're probably going to want to call your family. You just got called up to the big race. Congratulations. Oh, man. And I started oh. bawling in the chair. I, I mean, I lost, I lost my mind. Right. Called, called my mom, called my stepdad. My stepdad still owns this tavern in Wilmington, Illinois. And he held the phone up and he had a tavern full of people like, you got the call, you got the call. And everybody's cheering and screaming and I'm crying. And uh, I have to compose myself because you're going back out into a clubhouse where mm. everybody wants to get called up. Right. Two or three guys, your closest buddies are happy for you, but everybody else is like, damn. And all of a sudden, yeah, that should have been me. Mm-hmm. And then there's a couple of people that then will ostracize you for the next 20 really? minutes. Because well, because they're the ones that want to get called up. Not right. everybody in a clubhouse is Not a Not everybody's your person. cheerleader. That's yeah. right. Not yeah. everybody is. That's some, a little circle on that lesson. Uh, some it, people are holding yeah. pom-poms. Some people are holding pepper spray. So <laughs> there you go. We'll add that one to it. Do we have yep. permission to say yeah, that? Yeah, absolutely. Some people are holding pom pom. Yeah, that's why I said it. Some people are holding pom poms. Some people are holding pepper spray. So I composed myself and go outside. And uh, yeah, it was. I ended up going to Milwaukee, and which I'm originally from the Chicago area. Mm-hmm. They were on the road their last game, but they just flew me in there. And Mike McFarland made me go out and catch Kevin Apier. And he's got like seven different sliders, and he was right. mad because right. when he pitches, don't touch his stuff. Gubiza had to be in the dugout. His you know, routine. Don't talk to him like OCD routine, not routine. Right. I mean, like if you touch his glove, he will burn it after the game. And then, I mean, he's that kind of like wow. leave my stuff and me alone. That's just how he was. Wow. And I'm just dropping balls and dropping balls. But I thought they were doing it to, to rag on me. But what they were really doing was they knew that I had – 50 people coming to the game just to see me in my first big league oh, uniform. Okay. My right. parents were there. My sister was there. My high school coach was there. My college coach, teammates, friends were all up in Milwaukee back at the old stadium before they switched to the National stadium, League. Right. Yeah, yeah. Right. So, yeah, it was an interesting and, and very, very cool story. Very wow. humbling story. But I, I still took away from that, not just the getting called up factor. I took away from that that dude, you need to be humble at all times. Right. Humility cannot come selectively. So right. always learning, man. And yeah, that's just, that's just one of many. Um, there was another time I was on the DL sitting in the clubhouse. So the game was going on. Jeff Montgomery comes in and uh, he had just blown a lead, a rare time that Jeff Montgomery blows a lead. Right. And so he comes in and the spread tables out and there's hard plates 
he took a plate and didn't see me. And I'm standing, I'm, my locker was kind of catty corner behind this stone pillar. Right. And he whips it. I mean, Monty's a little dude, had a good arm. Oh, yeah. And he yeah. threw that Frisbee like plate across the room. It hit the wall or hit that stone pillar with such force that a fragment went through my jeans and stuck in my knee. Oh, and, I just, I, and I'm not, I'm, I'm, I'm a rookie, man. I'm deathly afraid. And I, I just like pull it pull out it and out. put my finger on it to keep the bleeding down till the game's over. I don't want mine to feel bad. I mean, right. like, that was fine. It was just a tiny little scrape. Wow. Right. So then he's in there. He's fuming. He's throwing stuff. He's mad. We end up tying the game. So Monty's going to go back out. And so Monty reaches because he'd already taken his jersey off. So he reaches down in the, the bin and puts on a Pichardo jersey and doesn't know it and takes off. Hippolito? Hippolito That's Pichardo. Amazing. Yeah. Yeah. So he's running out the so clubhouse. He's running down the tunnel. And then all of a sudden, our clubhouse guy, Mike Burkhalter, runs after him like, I got to see this man bleeding from the knee or not. So I run down and I chase him to find out, like, that'll be hilarious if he takes the field in a Pichardo jersey. Right as he gets to the top step, Somebody Burkhalter grabs him and pulls him back down. And then hands him his jersey, and he flips it off, and then he goes back out there. We end up winning the game. Wow. That's amazing. They yeah. should have just let him go. Got to let him go. At least they're a one pitch. Right. So get on the sports center. Yeah. 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 So did you a... did you ever tell Monty, like, bro, I, I got like 18 stitches. He, has no, he, he, doesn't, he even, doesn't even remember the entire incident. He's oh, just so wow. intense and right. focused. And, right. and he's like, oh, I'm sorry, man. I'm like, dude, I don't care. I was in the big leagues. You're Jeff Montgomery. You, wow. I'd have given you the other knee to throw a plate at. That's that's right. fine. So, yeah, it was. Uh, those were some intense times. But they were there's – so many things, you know, flights and hotels and clubhouse stuff and BP stuff. Uh, it's just, it was just all a blast. That's yeah. cool. What that's one of the favorite time. things we love hanging out with, mm -hmm. with guys like you, Les. It's just, yeah. it's the stories, man. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I, mean, I don't miss the games. I really don't miss the physical part because my right. body hurts sure. a lot. Sure. And I still have some joints that aren't completely attached, but right. I just, the one thing, and I don't even miss the pay. I mean, yeah, being a big leaguer is great money wise and the travel and you're playing a game you love. I just miss the guys. I miss hanging out. I miss the That's rain it. delays in the dugout, sliding on the tarp, playing cards. Wally Joyner beating me three games in a row, ping pong, 21 to nothing, all three games. I mean, oh my gosh. yeah, he it's was like, a freakish like good Forrest athlete. Forrest Gump of ping pong. He <laughs> might have beat Forrest Gump. He's that <laughs> good. Yeah, so yeah, awesome. it was That's just cool. a blast. Well, it's similar That's to like, what we were saying about even at our level with, with fantasy camp. Right, like it's not about the baseball. Like you, yeah. you, you don't mm -hmm. miss the games. You miss the fraternity. No. You miss playing cards. You mm -hmm. miss hanging out with your buddies. The it's conversation you know. from the clubhouse to field six. Yeah, yeah. you know. Yeah, it's exactly Absolutely. right. Walking yeah. up and, right. and back. So yeah. yeah, it's about getting out the car. You know, the next morning after the first day, and everyone's grunting and can hardly get out. And it's just again, it's not about being sore and uh, and getting out there and you know even striking out or whatever. But yeah. dude, it's all about talking trash, playing cards. Set next to Billy Butler, who <laughs> cussing up a storm, cussing up a storm, playing cards, and uh, so no man, it, it's amazing. Yeah. yeah, there's one more thing about fantasy camp, Cope, that I want you to understand too. Is um, you know there are some guys that go to fantasy camp to get away. They're escaping. They're they're they work hard for their money. It's not cheap to go, and they want to get around and just hang around with guys because when they come back to the real world, mm -hmm. it could be a marriage or it could be mm -hmm. uh, trouble at work, or they just need a week to get away. Okay. And I always notice the little things, you know, Bobby, I, I notice and love your humility and the teammate that you are and the way you talk to people and the way you open up to people. You're an exceptional athlete. You both are exceptional athletes, but you know, being an MVP of fantasy camp, it's kind of a big deal. There's a hundred and some guys there and, and you're younger than a lot of them, but they're good athletes and, and you earned that. That was a vote from everybody. And Cope, one of the things that, that I love about you is that when your bride comes down, the way your bride seeks you out, the way you <laughs> respond to her. And I, she's the boss. We know mine is too. <laughs> you know, we're all three of us. We That's know, it, right? but um, the way you could be sweaty, stinky, go for four or four. You've probably never gone over four in a fantasy camp game, right. but just in case, if you had a bad game and you're hard on yourself, so you could get three hits like me and right. you'd think of the fourth at bat, right. but you know, you're holding your wife's hand on the way back in, or you're putting your arm around her or, you know, people see that. And, you're not doing that on purpose. You're doing that because you genuinely love your bride and you foster that relationship and you take care of her. If I, you know, if I see her before I leave and I ask her something about you, that's going to be the truth of what's about you. And if you want to know how good a husband or a boyfriend is doing, look at the joy or lack of joy on their spouse or girlfriend's face. I've never seen your wife frown. 
Now we're all human beings. We right. all have our times, so, right. but whenever she's there, whenever I've seen her, she is a bundle of joy. That's because she's a woman of faith. She is a, a joyful person, but she wouldn't be that joyful all the time around you if you weren't being the husband that you are. So yeah, you both bring that. great things to the table. Don't forget that because that's that leaves an indelible mark on people. Appreciate that, Thank brother. You. Yeah. Thank you. Well, elevator that's, people. That's right, baby. That's, that's right. right. I think that's a good good way to wrap it up. If people yep. want to find you and listen to Breaking the Norm mm -hmm. and, and even uh, reach out to you about coaching and leadership, yeah. what's the best way to find you? Yeah, my website is just, it's with one S, it's just less at lessnorman.com. Not an ego thing. It was just available. Yeah. It's the name I got, so it's the name I'll use. So, yeah, it's just less at lessnorman.com uh, is uh, the email, and then the website is lessnorman.com. And I actually think I have my phone number on there, which is fine. I'm not right worried on. about it. You yeah. know, if something goes bad, I ch I've never had to change my number. In, in all these years. So yeah, it's just 913-908-6183 uh, or uh, lessnorman.com is a place to go. That's awesome, awesome, brother. Man, thank you so much for hanging out yeah. with us. You guys, this, this was, was a fun. Lot. You guys are good at this. this I'm sweating a bullets. Yeah. So I'm getting in here. My gray t-shirt is going to turn oh, into a dark gray right. t-shirt. And, and also thank you for being a mentor for us and saying, hey, you need to think about this, this, and yeah, this. For the you guys podcast. Podcast. I'll tell you what, right. you guys are right. really good at this. This was fun. This, uh, Five minutes into this thing, we would did we go like an hour? Oh, yeah. An hour and ten minutes. Wow, yeah. that's awesome. Right. But five minutes into this thing, this was just a conversation yeah. with really weird headpieces on. So <laughs> yeah. But yeah, that's you true. guys are fantastic <laughs> and uh you need to keep doing this. Yeah, awesome, thanks very bro. much. Appreciate it, man. Well. Thanks awesome. for listening, guys. This is the ABC podcast. Find us where you can listen and watch podcasts everywhere at Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and uh follow us on social media. Awesome. See you All guys. Right. Thanks, guys.